This is our very first episode, and today I've got two very special guests with us. Craig Zwiers is the owner of Basecamp Country, and we have Tom James. He's our national sales manager with Basecamp Country Real Estate. We're here to talk to these two guys and get to know them a little bit and see what it's all about. How's it going, guys? Going good. Fantastic. Good morning. Good to see you both. Yeah, you too. I want to introduce ourselves a little bit here, and we'll start with Craig. Craig, kind of give us a little bit of your history and tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you're from, and all that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. The owner of Base Camp Country Real Estate, I think it was last July 1st when uh, we did a little transition, ended up purchasing the company that day. And it's been a lot of fun ever since. Tom and I pretty much talk every day, working together. He's based out of Indiana, but our main office is out of Green Bay, Wisconsin here. Got into real estate probably nine, ten years ago. And yeah, started with base camp. I met Tom five or six years ago. We had our first meeting ever when we kind of formed the company. What made you decide to get into real estate? Actually, my brother and I wanted to start purchasing hunting properties and improving them, kind of flipping them. And we did that a few times. And then, you know, just by nature of the beast, people started coming up to us and asking to find them land or, you know, help sell their land. So that's how we got into it. I, I worked for a local company uh, when I first started. And then Nathan Murnack, the CEO of Basecamp Leasing, um, had called my broker and yeah, that's how it all started. We drove down to Indiana and had our first meeting with probably what, three or four states time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. It's funny to think back uh, to that first meeting. How many states is base camp country up to now? 13 or 14. Is it 14? We're, we're in 14 and counting. Yes, sir. Wow. Just got mm. into Iowa a couple weeks ago. Really? That's our newest, newest one. Um, I go back a little farther. I was a landscape contractor with a landscape architecture degree from Purdue with a wildlife management um, background. So kind of always been wildlife oriented and, and interested in habitat and everything like that. But I was a landscape contractor here in central Indiana until the economic downturn, I guess you would call it, from 2007 to nine. And I, I held on a little bit longer. Uh, trying to trying to modify my business model to stay active, but there was so much depletion of the resource of as far as clientele around here in Indiana that eventually closed it down. I got my real estate license, was doing some habitat consulting work and things like that. I uh, started working for a competitor of ours in 2014, I believe. Worked there for five years, uh, representing East Central Indiana, and then Steve Mang, who was the owner of Base Camp Country, excuse me, Base Camp Leasing, an old friend of mine, uh, tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I would be interested in coming and helping start this project of creating a new real estate company from the ground up. And I turned him down, I think, two or three times because I was just, you know, kind of comfortable in in my current role. But the offer was too good to pass up. It was uh, something exciting to be a part of building a brand pretty much from scratch, even though leasing had a 20 year history here in this country and across 28 states, I believe, but, uh, took on that, that challenge, uh, left my, my, my private business and, and came to work with, with base camp country. And it's been a, uh, a fun thrill ride ever since, you know, it's just a lot of, uh, a lot of challenge and satisfaction in meeting new people and hiring new talented folks and training and supporting the, there's never a dull day here. The phone rings and there's always a new challenge. Somebody's dealing with something new all the time, but we're, we're having a good time at it. And I, I'm excited for the future because we're heading in the right direction and we've got a great team of awesome people for sure. We really do, man. I, uh, I joined base camp country a few months ago now. I don't know. I can't remember when, but uh, I think it was back in May. We're in what September now. So been here for a little bit, uh, but I absolutely love this place, man. I really do. The guys here are awesome. It's different than any other real estate company I've ever seen. And everybody, like we went to the national sales meeting up, you know, in Wisconsin earlier, a couple months ago, and every agent was there. It was super awesome. Everybody got along. We all talked and had a great, great time. I really did enjoy it up there. So 
I appreciate you guys bringing me on board and I'm excited to get this podcast going. So thanks for doing what you guys have done so far, man. It's, it's great. Yeah. We love having you on board and I'm glad you brought up that meeting because it was a great time. We got to do that more than once a year. We got to try to do it at least twice. Yeah. I think doing it at least twice would be fantastic, man. Maybe once a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, you're, you're sort of a testimony kicks of a prime example of finding the needle in the haystack. There's, you know, there's a lot of people out there that would love to be able to work in the outdoor industry or, or work in, in land. And Craig and I are tasked with the, uh, the challenge of finding those people, you know, and seeking them out. And we get a lot of inquiries about working for us. I'd say one out of every five to 10 kind of makes, makes the cut, fits the, it's the model of the type of person that we're looking for. And it's, it doesn't take long, um, even just on a phone call, but before you get to understand what a person's all about it, and we're really good at picking up the, uh, the aspects or the attributes of people that, that carry those characteristics and qualities that we're looking for. So you had an enthusiasm from the very beginning, even before you started working for us, that was just, you know, you could feel it through the phone. And then obviously when we met you, it was very apparent and it's contagious too. So I want you to know that you've been a positive influence on the team for the, even just a short amount of time that you've been here. So we, we're super excited to have you. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. It's kind of a funny story how I got even involved in base camp in the first place, but uh, I was with another real estate company for two years before I came over to base camp. And uh, I always wanted, my, my specialty was always in land. I always wanted to sell land and that's like what I wanted to do for the first two years. I, I did sell quite a bit of land, but I also sold some houses, but houses aren't really my thing. You know, I was looking on the internet one day at all these different land companies and scrolling through my Facebook feed one day and base camp country real estate came across my Facebook feed and I was like, huh, what's this all about? And I clicked it, kind of checked out the page and I was like, man, that might be a cool place to apply to, you know? It was late at night, like midnight or something, and I just kept on scrolling, kind of forgot about it. Then, like two weeks later, I'm like, man, I really got to do something. I got to make a change, you know? <laughs> I was like, what was the name of that company that I seen on Facebook the other day? I couldn't remember it. I just started Googling, you know, land agents and land real estate companies, and uh, you guys came up, and I was like, that's it. I remembered it as soon as I seen it. I was like, that's it. Got on there and applied, but yeah. It's kind of funny how it all worked out. It's meant to be. I remember the first time I talked to Tom about you, where Tom's like, I just talked to Kix Nelson. There's a new inquiry that we had received. He's like, you got to talk to him. This guy's phenomenal. You're going to love him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I sure appreciate it, man. And I, uh, I was super excited about the opportunity. I honestly didn't know if I even had a chance. And so I was really glad to, to come on board and get a, get an opportunity and, hopefully make the best of it here. So thank you guys very much. Well, yeah, man, it's, it's a pleasure having you. The other thing that people may not know about you is that you, you're an entrepreneur in your own right. And when you told me about your background and the current businesses that you've developed and run, um, it's, it's a little different than what most guys would think, but I, it's very respectful what you've done and what you've built. And I admire you for what you, what you've already created in your and the name, the logo, all your stuff that, and your activity on social media, when we saw, man, I, it was just soon into the process of, of you coming on board. And I looked into your other stuff for your other companies and the, uh, the following that you gathered just with, with your, your consistent posting and social media stuff. It was like, this guy's going to, this guy's going to be a winner. You just can't help it. You know, there's, yeah. So, well, I mean, obviously you're interviewing us, but tell, no, that, that's tell, a, yeah. Talk about that. Cool. So, yeah, I mean, I, I own a barbershop or it's called Outlaw Gentleman Barbershop. And, uh, we've been around for almost eight years, been a little over seven and a half now, uh, February will be eight years. We started off with one location in a little bitty town called Rogersville, Missouri. And, uh, you know, Rogersville at the time had about 3000 people in it. It's actually the number one, uh, growing city in Missouri right now though. So it's growing, booming fast. And, uh, anyway, about a year ago, we decided to open our second location over there. And, uh, 
yeah, it's been rocking and rolling too. We, we opened it in Ozark, Missouri, which is just about 30 miles down the road. So two locations, I've got about 10 barbers that work for me right now. And, uh, just try to keep that place going, keep them guys busy and keep people coming in the door. And we're pretty big on social media for, you know, just staying in front of people's faces. And I think it's, I think social media is very important. I just had a video. I don't know if you guys seen it or not, but I just had a video go viral on TikTok the other day. And, uh, it was just me cutting a guy's hair and it's up to like 170,000 views or something and tons Jeez. Tons of likes. I saw it came, came into my feed. Did it? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's been good and it, it's taught me a lot. You know, it's, uh, taught me how to communicate with people. I mean, I talk to people every single day and, uh, you know, honestly, it's been really good for my real estate career. I mean, pretty much everybody that I've ever sold a home to or a piece of land to has came directly from my barber chair. That's been fantastic. And the reason I got into real estate is because you know, let's be honest, I'm getting older and can't stand there and cut hair 10 hours a day, every day, forever. Uh, I was looking towards my, uh, you know, towards my retirement from cutting hair is kind of why I got into this, try to build this up over the next few years. We're slowly, surely get, so good plan. Good plan. Tom, you said you, uh, graduated from Purdue university. Uh, I just, I'm curious about this landscape architecture degree you have, because a lot of people may not know what that is. And when I read that online, I was kind of like, man, I got to talk to him about that. Cause what does that consist of exactly? It's a lot more involved than people think about drawing circles where you're going to plant trees, you know, and shrubs around a house, which is the first thing that comes to mind. There's a lot of urban planning involved in landscape architecture. There's surveying, there's drainage calculations, all kinds of things. A lot of it is is oriented towards civil planning, designing streets, subdivision layouts, fitting homes on lot lines and things like that. But all, of course, the, the natural side of it, which is what always intrigued me, knowing all the native North American species of trees, shrubs, and ground covers and plants and things like that, Along with, unfortunately, non-natives too that 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 fit into the land. The the landscape plants cover a broad spectrum, um, and and they are very centric to where you live and the region and the zones that you live and operate in. My ed education, of course, was was geared towards the Midwest, but there, when you really look at from the beginning stages of landscape architecture, my freshman year, you're just doodling and drawing circles and practicing the, the script for your architectural style hand printing and things like that, all the way up to the senior year where you're designing community layouts and setting setting elevations and, and drainage calculations for how much water retention that, that area will require for holding water in a pond when it rains, just different things that involve engineering, surveying, calculations. Of course, you have to be a decent, I won't say naturally gifted myself, art artist, you know, to be able to draw and label and, and render drawings, which means coloring. So there's a lot involved there. I started to say a second ago that I didn't start there at, at Purdue with that in mind. I actually started in wildlife management and I, I transferred into landscape architecture my sophomore year because the job market was really bleak for a wildlife biologist or a, a wildlife manager. And the starting salaries were just dismal. I think I remember hearing a lecture of like twelve to $14,000 a year. And 25% of us in that class could, could plan on landing a, a job in that field. And I felt guilty about it. I thought my parents are putting me through college, you know, and I'm I mean, I, I helped a lot, but they were, they were paying my way for the most part. And I just felt like I was doing them an injustice and my, my, I had to sort of be realistic with myself. Can I live with myself coming out of here and, and, you know, earning 12 grand a year. And, uh, I, I decided to step over into landscape architecture because one of my summer jobs was in construction management and I was planting and building retaining walls and seeding and sodding with this company. And I got to work alongside a landscape architect and I, I really kind of admired his, his job, you know, and I got to look over his shoulder and he and I talked over plans just about every, every day on a new job. And, 
and I, and that's the kind of the, the light bulb went out. That looked, you know, off in my head that I think I could do that. But the cool thing was I was able to still blend those two things together. Eventually, my design background has led me to be able to blend wildlife management and habitat improvement with design. And this kind of served me well. Yeah, well, for those of you that don't know Tom James, you guys just search this guy up on YouTube and you'll find a ton of videos on yeah. YouTube with uh, him talking about wildlife management, talking about landscape architecture, how to build food plots and different stuff like that. And he's very knowledgeable. And I think what you guys, what you do, Tom, is incredible. And that's one thing I really like about Base Camp Country is we have at least, what, four or five guys probably that, you know, either have their degree in wildlife management or some kind of landscape architecture degree, stuff like that. Yeah, thank you for the compliment. I didn't start out to be somebody on video. I was asked a long time ago to be a, a member of the Management Advantage team because I came to the industry with a food plot product and a piece of equipment that I designed called the Ferminator. And my relationship in that, where I was out marketing and advertising the implement, led me into the path of these guys. We, we joined forces. I, I did some marketing and advertising with them. But then way beyond that, I became a team member as a contributor for content and instructional things from, from Indiana. So ever since I joined the management advantage team, excuse me, it's just been more or less like me sharing what works for me. I don't ever say this is the way you have to do things, but I enjoy just sharing things that I've learned over the years doing it. I've been doing it for gosh darn you know, since I was in my 20s and I'm almost 60 years old now. So I got some trial and error behind me of things that I've tried that have uh, led me to a system that works for me. And the thing about landscape, excuse me, wildlife management is it's an art form. You know, it's just there's no 100 percent right way to do anything all the time. There's especially when you start adding design element into it, that uh, it, it really is. It's working with some basic, simple principles of sunlight equals growth and good soils create growth and, and deer and wildlife are a product of what they consume. And, you know, there's a lot of just different things about some elementary principles that if you just let things do what they're supposed to do the right way, then you get some great results. It's been fun. I enjoy it. You know, I don't make a dollar off of what we do with uh, the production of the management advantage. I, I don't get rewarded any other way other than feeling like I'm sharing some good information with people that might need to hear it. Sure. Um, I was Tom, I was blown away the first time that I saw a full-fledged plan that you had put together. I didn't realize there was that much into it. And after you see all the, I guess, design and the things that you put together, it's super impressive. Thank you. Because like you, when I first started, like when we would go back and buy a piece of property and improve it, we're just sticking food plots wherever we can and blinds and there was no rhyme or reason. So when I saw one of your first plans, I was like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> it's a whole different world out there. Well, you're right. Food is obviously a very important aspect of a plan, but then there is also usability and access and coming and going. Can you get in? Can you get out? How about security cover? How about no-go zones or, or some, some uh, sanctuary areas? There's yeah, you can put food in a in a in a field and and hunt around it and hope to to tag a deer coming or, or going. But can you get in there and get out every day with different wind directions and screening re requirements? And people, I don't think really give the white-tailed deer enough credit for how astute they are and how aware of their surroundings they are. The deer that people never see will would probably blow your mind because of the fact that they just throw caution to the wind and and go hunt. You know, so there's when you really want to set up a property to hunt well, especially the smaller parcels that most guys can afford, it's it does take a lot of planning to be able to not wear it out and, and to hunt it properly, but to keep the deer, excuse me, and other wildlife for that matter, unaware as possible of your presence and your and your exit and entries. So that that's a big part of it. Well, if you guys have any question about how serious this guy takes his wildlife management and his deer hunting. Uh, I got a funny story because yesterday I had to call Tom and I texted him. I was like, Hey man, you got a minute to talk. He's like, no, he's like, I'll call you back in a little bit. He's like, I'm on the edge of a 
bedding spot, putting up a tree stand, and I don't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that you respected that. You said, yeah, no problems. <laughs> yeah, no, I ain't got a problem with that. I know how important that is, but I just thought it was funny. I was like, man, that's a guy that takes this serious, you know. You don't even yeah. want to talk while you're putting a tree stand up. That's fantastic. Yeah, and the stand was already there. You know, I wouldn't even, well, you could be super, super cautious, but here we are in the middle of September and, and season opens here in a couple of weeks. But all I was really doing was checking the safety on the chains and straps and maybe maybe just snipping a few branches quietly and cautiously and, and getting the heck out of there. So I'm late doing that this year. We did, we've did we done so much work on the property as far as following up the timber harvest and spraying invasive species and getting plots planted and maintained and all the main stuff that the hunting part of things suffered a little bit this year, the hunting preparation stuff, I should say. So I'm late getting my stands tuned and my, my son-in-law unfortunately had to be out of town this last weekend. So my son-in-laws, both of them were, I was out there solo doing, doing some work, but that that's, that's kind of cool in itself too. It's, it was a nice peace, peaceful weekend for me. There you go. There you go. So your season opens October 1st. It does. Yeah. Our, ours is next weekend. Yeah. I've seen, yeah. well, I don't want to break too much and steal his thunder yet, but we had one of our guys uh, from Indiana that went to Kentucky over the weekend and tagged a really awesome buck on a, on a, just a weekend trip to Kentucky. Zach Stevens and nice. he's uh, got it he's got it on film and he did a good follow up and it's his best buck to date and he was sending me some pictures over the weekend so yeah it it's Kentucky starts early a lot of states do start the middle of the month of September we're always an October 1st opener here and frankly for for us and when I say us the guys you know the family that hunts with me we're we're really careful in the first half of October we try to hit some doe quota, you know, get some early doe harvest done and we're hunting some areas that are not really in the core of some of the real sensitive areas to try to keep the property fresh. And, um, again, keep those bucks unbeknownst that we've been there and, and, and keep them unpressured. But, you know, when it hits opening day, everybody wants to try to get out, especially with the weather that we've had the last couple of days here, it's been super cool. Yeah. And you know, the, the itch is out there, you know, we want to get out yeah. and, and get in that cool, crisp autumn air and start hunting. But uh, October 1st is staring us squarely in the face. It's coming quick. Yeah. We'll be, we'll be at it before you know it. We open September 15th in Missouri next weekend. Is that where you got? Yeah. yeah. Yep. I don't know if it's the 14th or 15th, but next, next Saturday. How long does your bow season yeah. go in Wisconsin? Middle, end of January, depending on where you're at. Okay, they got different zones up there. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. What about you, Tom? And yeah, we're statewide here. We close whatever that Sunday is, the first weekend in, in January. But that's the, we have some broken up se seasons, probably like you guys too. We have an archery season that opens. Then we have a, a firearm season that opens, give or take, the second or third weekend in, in November that runs two weeks. And then we have a similar structure muzzleloader season that comes in around December the 10th while bow season's going on through that entire thing. And then um, our archery season does close at the that that's first Sunday in January, typically. Yeah, I think it closes for us on like the 15th of January. We typically go from September 15th to January 15th with, you know, it closes down there during the uh, rifle season in November. Ours used to, but and then now it, it carries right through the, the firearm season as well. You just have to wear orange like the firearm hunters do. A question for you guys, though, with openers around September the 15th, is there any chance that you would have an opportunity at a, a buck still in velvet where you're at? Well, it's pretty few and far between. It does happen, but it's not like when you're going to a September 1st opener. I mean, we used to go to Wyoming all the time, and there's a really good chance you're shooting one in velvet there. But here, it's, yeah, it's pretty few and far between. It's about the same here in Missouri, too. Like, I've seen it happen before. I've never done it, but I've seen it. Some of my buddies have, you know, with just a little bit, but not, like, full coverage or anything. Gotcha. Yeah, there's a lot that happens between the very end of August and the 15th. Most of them are coming out by then. 
Yeah. So I almost had a dynamite lease down by you in Missouri. My uh, dad and I drove down there a few weeks ago, went and checked it out. And it must have got hit pretty hard with EHD because we found a lot of dead deer in the one ravine we walked down. So it was pretty disappointing. That's what typically we are seeing right now in the Midwest. There's a lot of it going around here, unfortunately, not again this year, but fortunately not as bad as we've had it, which is spread by a biting little small fly called a midge that'll bite a, a deer around their nose or eye tissue around these shrinking water pools when it gets hot and dry and it spreads the virus that gives these deer this uh, feverish sickness caused by a virus. And many times they're found dead. If they succumb to it, they're found dead near a, a body of water, a creek, a pond, or a, even a, a river, Some sometimes even floating in the water as they try to cool themselves down from, from the fever. But um, that was that, were the deer that you found just recently killed or dead from that, they, Craig? Yeah, they all were. They were most of them were pretty fresh, but I was just surprised when we went down there. Cause I haven't heard, I didn't hear anything leading up to that week of EHD in, in Missouri or that area. And then when we went down there, I mean, we found seven dead deer in a few hundred yards. I've never seen anything like that before. And then driving back, I was on Facebook and sure enough, I started seeing other people and links pop up that had the same problem in that area. That's What's wild problem. about that is even in a county that has has um, cases of it or or results of it, that you can be in one small micro area where as many as 40 plus percent of the deer will die from a very serious outbreak, but you can just go one township over and it's light to non-existent. So it's very hot zones where very related to specific areas that that can be extremely hard hit. There's a couple counties out east of us here, Franklin County, Union County, on down into uh, north, excuse me, into Henry County. There's a zone right through there along the Whitewater River and, and slightly above that. The last several years, they were hit so hard that the DNR did an emergency adjustment to the to the bonus or the, the doe harvest quota from last year and pretty much reduced it to zero just to make sure that we weren't taking any more deer out there than than necessary or that should be allowed to allow the, to, them to recover from the, the depletion of numbers. And this year I saw some posts, some guys were finding some dead deer again in the same zones, but luckily it seemed like it's ta tapered off here in the last few days, not as many that were starting to show up a week or two ago. But we had a stretch here of 95 to 90, you know, six, 98 degree days with, with no rainfall. But uh, yeah, that's the conditions that set it up, hot, dry weather and, and no rain and deer are forced to, to get water from shrinking pools of water. And that's where the life cycle of those biting little flies uh, survive and prosper and, and reproduces around those little muddy pools. That's too bad. I can't, I can't believe how devastating it is. My first experience was in Wyoming with that probably 15-ish years ago. My dad and I were out there and I was actually in a stand that we had set up the year prior and I noticed out in the field I could I could see a look like a deer just flailing around on the ground and it was a mature buck a big old heavy eight pointer and he was just dying of of that disease a blue tongue the rancher out there had called it at the time and um I found another one the next day and then he has 20 20,000 acres I was tagged out so I'm like I'm going to go shed hunting and I'm going to search his property, see how many dead deer I could find. And I think I had over a dozen mature bucks that I found just falling ravines and, and floating in ponds. It was, is hard to, you know, see. And the next year we definitely did not see as many deer. It took a huge toll on the herd. And that was the first week of September. I don't know if that's generally pretty late for that disease. I feel like normally it's in the summertime. Yeah. From what I've seen the reports of, usually you you think of mid-August as being the hot, dry season, and that's when it's, I've seen it show up here before then, like late July, but typically it's the month of August. I'd say you were at the tail end of it there, Craig, but really the only relief that they get is either a frost to kill those little, you know, to set those biting flies, those midges back, or a lot of rainfall yeah. to flush out those water sources and to refresh everything. 
I can't speak to this personally, but I do know that I've read a lot of information and seen it talked about in, as far as wildlife biologists are concerned, why you find the propensity of larger, older age class bucks that, that succumb to that or to die from that. One of the theories is that when those bucks are around those water holes, the heat signal that their velvet covered antlers full of blood are, are giving off to those flies. It's one of the easiest spots for them to land as opposed to the nose and ears and, and eye area of, of a, say, a smaller buck or a doe. And there's blood flowing through that fresh velvet growing. It's just a larger surface area place for them to be attracted to, to bite and that virus to be in, injected into their, into their circulatory system. So that, I don't know that that's been proven yet, but it's a theory. Makes sense. Yeah. So is that something like when it gets colder, does that kind of go away? Like they it does freeze out. Yep. It goes away. It's really only a snapshot through the late summer and that, that it's prevalent and it shows up. But like I said, it's usually either the frost or the cool weather generally that really suppresses the activity of those flies, or you get a big rainfall that flushes those water holes out and, and gets rid of all the, uh, the stagnant water with a, it kind of covers up the muddy zones around those ponds that, that those flies hatch out of and, and reproduce it. Hmm. Interesting. I just got educated on and something I had no idea about. On the other hand, here in Wisconsin, CWD is very prevalent. So they say, but I hunt here every day during the season. And I don't think I've ever found a, a dead deer, or found a deer suffering that I know was from CWD. So I struggle with that. I, I feel like I would see more deer suffering or, or dead because of CWD if it was so bad. I think that... The fear of widespread cases of CWD is what motivates wildlife biologists to make plans ahead because this is a really political discussion and maybe we don't want to get too far off into the weeds with this because there are people dead set out there that it's a hoax and that it's a way for wildlife agencies to, to manipulate the, the resource. I tend to believe the other direction. There are some really talented people in the wildlife biology field that, that I have a lot of respect for that understand the cause behind the organism or the organism itself that that causes chronic wasting disease is a mutated protein called a prion some people call it a prion p-r-i-o-n and that it can exist in the soil for decades after uh, it establishes itself it takes i think 1200 or 1400 degrees to uh, of uh, incineration to kill it it's basically a, almost like a mutated organism that makes me think of an alien, you know, when, when it's that bizarre. Once it's proven to be found on a location, you're, you're stuck with it. So it's the fear of that weird cre creature that, that causes the disease in the first place that agencies are projecting not what happens or if we're going to get CWD, but how will we live with it going forward in the future? Is deer hunting going to be the same as it is today? And the answer is no. If it does, if it does spread and continues to move across the country, I don't think, Craig, to your point, we haven't seen mass results of it yet because thank God it's, it hasn't, it hasn't manifested itself, but there are some preventative measures yeah, the, the mass extinction or, or execution or elimination of all the deer in a county around a hot zone was tried. And as you know, Craig, in your home state, that's that's where it originated from. I shouldn't say originated. That's where it jumped from the west where it was found in Colorado, in a, in a I think, right? Mule deer and elk area yeah. and, and, and then found its way to the Midwest. Side note, and again, a very political issue, is that the transport of deer captive deer across state lines across the country and to captive breeders is suspect of how that it found its way over here in the first place. In good measure, agencies realize that and that therefore there's there's been a lot of control over the transporting of wild animal cervids, deer and, and elk across state line um, and the management and uh, inspections, you know, routine inspections of of course, you can't test for chronic wasting disease until the animal's dead. That's the only way that you can verify that it had it through some brain tissue or a lymph node and things like that. It's just a super weird disease all the way around. And it's one that it's one to be cognizant of and, and 
maybe afraid of in a healthy dose to make sure. I do believe it's some of the guys that are out there saying it's a hoax and a lie. Uh, I just disagree with it. You yeah. know, you just got to be, you got to be, you got to be careful, get what you wish for, get what you turn your back on something and, and dismiss it. Then you, you may be very, very sorry for the results of what you would have, have to deal with your, you know, years in advance. Yeah. Sounds like Missouri is going through that right now. Trying to figure out a way to, you know, lessen it or mitigate it a little bit. I was talking to a conservation agent about it here a while back. And I think he told, if I remember correctly, I think what he said is if they, they do the CWD testing on all these deer. And if they find one that tested positive, I think within five miles of that County, then they go ahead and put that County in a CWD zone just to be safe. I think. I think at this point, 95 or more percent of the counties in Wisconsin are kind of in this, the CWD, I don't know, not a lockdown, but where you can't bait at all. Yeah. One of the few I actually live in, you still can bait, but most of them you cannot. It floors my mind that there's some states you can still bait in. Yeah. Go out to Kansas. They just dump trucks full of corn out. Yeah, there are quite a few states that still do it. Indiana kicks is similar to what you said Missouri was. You can put supplements out. You can put feed out, but you have to have every stitch. Of any trace of that removed 10 days before uh, before season starts. And I said trace because if you are hunting near a suspected mineral site, they will test the soil and sample it to see for its salt content. And you can be absolutely written a ticket and and hit pretty hard by by hunting with 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 uh you know law enforcement punishment from from hunting near or around a trace of that oh wow so, you you think that mineral would be in the ground for a very very long time It'd it be would hard to get rid of yeah so they say it's even written in the in the regulations that you if you remove any contaminated or affected soil and a lot of guys do that you know, you can dig up the hole and, and pack it out and, and bring in some fresh dirt and fill your hole in. But if they, if they test down, if, especially it's been a historical site where you've had salt there for many, many years, when the rain, it leaches into the soil and, you know, you're not digging it all the way out. It, if they test in there and want to find it, I'm sure they'll find it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's almost better to not have it near you at all, as opposed to try to play the game of, covering it up or not covering it up, but eliminating or removing it and bringing in. So it's, and I, and I know there there's regulations written exactly specifically to the verbiage as far as how far away you can be from that location to hunt, legally hunt by it, but it's to the officer's discretion if they feel like you are intercepting deer on their way to that location too. So it leaves a big gray area there that, man, just it's, Better to play safe than sorry. Yeah. And if there's one thing I've learned over the years, don't take your chances with a game warden. Just don't do it. No. No. Those guys take their job very seriously, and you don't even want to take a chance. And I respect that because we need good policing of our resources, our wildlife resources. Hundreds. We all hate it when we see deer getting poached or guys taking more than their quota, you know, abusing the, the laws and the and the game, game quotas and things like that. We We see it, and it just infuriates you you know so those guys are trained well to to protect that resource yeah we definitely have to have them i think they definitely do a great job and i know a few of them personally and they're really great guys but they do take their job very seriously and i would too if i was in their position so good for them absolutely yeah. talk to us about what your plan is for the future of base camp country and kind of where you see this thing going and Craig, if you want to jump in here on some of that, uh, I'm sure you have a vision for this place. And we'd just like to, like to kind of hear about where you'd like to see Base Camp Country in the future. Yeah. No, Tom and I talk about this probably, I mean, for sure, weekly, if not daily, where, I mean, our two goals are to find the best agents possible that fit our culture and, you know, what we're trying to do as a company not so much tailored towards residential but more farm and land sales and then you know so it's it's recruiting the right people and then also training them and we just started getting into that a lot a lot more now where we need to train you guys on how to 
I don't know, do procedures better and just, you know, become better land agents. That's our two, two main goals really right now is to just grow and train. And I think if we do that the right way, everything will take care of itself. Sure. Tom, what do you think? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I may add to that too. Uh, really the land sales business is one of the most enjoyable careers a guy could have. I, I say all the time to our new, our new recruits that for a 90 hour to 110 hour um, coursework required for training for basically education, you have the potential to earn doctor and lawyer kind of money. And it's just really the sky's the limit to how motivated you are, what area you live in. If you're blessed to live in a good area, of course, you're, you know, you're a step ahead of a lot of people, but it's really dependent upon you to set your, to set your goals and how much money you want to earn. So I think the model that I would love to see is that us spread across the states that we're led into, and we, we go a lot of times where good people lead us, mm -hmm. not, necess necess not necessarily just because we want to be there, but we have actually skipped over many states to open up into a, a new area because the right people were there to fit the need, and we just couldn't pass up the opportunity. But my idea, ideal, I should say, is that we would be in the states that we're led that we have a great team of people that can cover those areas of that state, but those people are making a great living, enjoying life and telling others about us, you know, doing the best they can to represent buyers and sellers and having happy clientele and, and happy lives of their, of their selves. Because as Craig said, if our folks are doing great and making money and, and enjoying life, then that makes the company the same. We are no better than the people that are out there on the ground representing us every day. And the right team will cause this company to grow and do very well. Right. Yep. You said it right there, Tom. And Kix, you're a good example of exactly what we're looking for. It makes coming to work very easy, talking and having to deal with you every day. Yeah. So that's what we're looking for. Well, if there's one thing I've learned as a business owner over the last eight years, it's hiring the right people is probably the most important thing to the success of your company. I have made that mistake and just, you know, hired some people that quite honestly didn't need to be hired in the first place. And uh, one thing I've had to teach myself along the way is you need to hire quick and you need to fire quicker. And, uh, you know, it's hard to do sometimes, but I think it's very important to hire the right people in the first place and keep them on the ground and keep them going. And that's one thing I've been trying to teach myself recently. So. I'm glad to yeah. hear you guys are already on that path. Yeah, Absolutely. there's a state in particular, I'm not even going to name it, but we wanted to get into this state so bad. I mean, for the last five, five years now, and we just weren't running across the right people to get into that state. So we didn't, and it sat vacant there for the longest time. And, you know, finally, a few weeks ago now, we're finally into that state. We got the right guy, you know, to lead lead it for us so super exciting but yeah it's about being patient and just having the right people in place i think another another thing i'd like to see if i may add as i've thought about this since you asked the question mm -hmm. we have a good deal of our guys that are are still working for another career you know basically their full-time or their main job that chose to do this as a as something that they wanted to get into but grow it into their lifelong dream of working into this strictly and solely, I'd love to see more guys make that ultimate transition. We've seen several guys over the last couple of years that have have taken the leap of faith, knowing and understanding that I've only got so many hours in a week and I'm almost in a catch-22 because I can't grow this anymore because I'm not allowed or not capable of putting those extra hours into it. But they've jumped off into faith and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue this as my full-time career. And again... It's, it's what you put into it. It's the hours and the effort and the intent, you know, that, that consistency that you put into it, that, that really allows you to make it flourish. So my other objective or goal would be to see more guys, more guys step off into that direction. But kicks you'll, you'll like to hear there's a really big correlation with the guys who jump and become full-time and their sales numbers. I mean, those are all of our top guys. Yeah, I know. It, yeah, uh, and kicks. I wasn't necessarily speaking about you. No, I know. so don't think I was. No, singling yeah. you out there. 
No, uh, yeah, there's a lot of us that do kind of what I do, you know, and to me, I've been in the business for, you know, two and a half years selling real estate and I've sold quite a bit of real estate in those two and a half years, but I can only imagine if I was putting the full time hours into it, where I would be with it. You know what I mean? I think you set a record for our company, actually. Did I? Quickest, um, was it the quickest deal or quickest transaction under contract anyway? Yeah. After coming on board. Yeah, I think so. That ain't bad. <laughs> Need to get some more now. I've been slacking a little bit here. So. <laughs> We're turning up the heat. Been, they, yeah, things have been picking up, though, overall. I mean, it actually was kind of slow this summer, but now it's back on fire again. Well, guys, I think we got a pretty good episode here, and we've just about hit that hour mark, and I don't think people are going to want to listen to us talking for longer than an hour you got a lot more to do today yeah we got a few more we're going to record today so your your son-in-law is coming on next um kicks appreciate you doing this i think it's amazing it's uh if if people don't know who base camp country is already it's that they're going to soon see us more and more more and more places and and hear about us so this is just another way to get our brand awareness out there and to know, uh, let people know that there are there are options out there in the land business because we got a great group of, of fantastic people, and we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. Absolutely. Well, appreciate you been, doing it. Yeah, this has been great and a great conversation. Uh, everybody, I appreciate you guys listening. This is actually our very first episode of the Base Camp Country Podcast, and we're just going to keep releasing episodes as they come. So, appreciate you guys listening, and I guess we will see you on the next round. Thanks, Kicks. thanks, guys.